Hello everyone and welcome back to an all new Sermons in the Park. As always, I am your Reverend Jamie McCaskill. Again, I want to take this time to thank each and every one of you for joining me here again on this beautiful Sunday. Or whenever you join me, you know, if you're not joining me here today, whenever you join me, I'll still thank you. Thank you for joining me here. It's always wonderful to have you here. Um, so let's go ahead and thank our Heavenly Father for all the gifts that He's given us. Father, I want to thank you for all those who are watching. I want to thank you for my family, for the family of all of those who are watching. You know, they brought them here, Lord. I want to thank you for, uh, for everything that you've given us, our air, our food, our water, um, all the gifts of life that we've been receiving, you know, the energy to get up and go to work, the energy that we need to climb out of bed, the energy that it takes to open a door, these are all things that you've given us. The food, like I said, the water, all of those things, all these great gifts, things that we don't even see. Like I've mentioned here every week, Lord, you give us things that are on a molecular level. There are things that we don't even notice that you give us. And I want to thank you this time to thank you for that. You're amazing and loving and wonderful. You're so kind and gentle. You, you sent your son to die so that we can have forgiveness and be closer to you. This is all because of you. You created it. You you create the water that creates the clouds and the skies. This is all yours, Lord, and we thank you for it. Thank you for allowing us to be here. We love you, Father. Amen. So, here we are. We're continuing our review of the book of Judges. And I mentioned last week... How we're going to be there. This week we're in chapter 6, right? And I mentioned last week, and I'm going to mention it here again today. Chapter 6 is just a bit longer, and uh, we have a lot <laughs> to discuss with this chapter. So it will be divided into two separate videos. I hope that's okay with you. Um, it's going to be, you know, it's just, like I said, it's just a bit more to, to go into. So um, now, here at the beginning, we're going to see that Israel has now fallen into the hands of, what, of of a people who were known as the Midianites. Now, they were descended from one of several of the children of Abraham and uh, and uh, someone named Keturah. And they're named Midian. He, he was also sent away to the east so that uh, Isaac would be Abraham's heir. Okay, We read about this back in Genesis. So let's go ahead and look at that. We're going to look at Genesis chapter 25, verses 1 to 6. Then again, Abraham took a wife. Her name was Keturah. She bare him Zimran, and Joxon, and Midian, and Median, sorry, and Midian, and Ishbak, and Shua. And Joxon begat Sheba, and Dedan. And the sons of Dedan were Ashurim, and Lethushim, and Lumim, and the sons of Midian, Ephah, Ephir, Henak, Abida, Elda, and these were the children of Keturah. And Abraham gave all that he had unto Isaac. But unto the sons of the concubines which Abraham had, Abraham gave gifts and sent them away from Isaac, his son, while he yet lived eastward unto the east country. It was the Midianite merchants that we see later sold, who, who later sold, if you remember, when Joseph was sold into the hands of the Egyptians, this was actually Midianite merchants. And we can see this in Genesis chapter 37. If you look at verses 23 through 28. You'll see it says, And it came to pass, when Joseph was coming to his brethren, that they stripped Joseph of his coat, his coat of many colors that was on him. And they took him and cast him into a pit, and the pit was empty, and <coughs> there was no water. And they sat down to eat bread, and they lifted up their eyes and looked. And behold, a company of Ishmaelites came from Gilead with their camels, bearing spicery and balm and myrrh, coming carry it into carry it down to Egypt okay and Judah said unto his brethren what profit is it we slay our brother 
and conceal his blood. Come, let us sell him to the Ishmaelites, and let not our hand be upon him. He is our brother, and our flesh, and his brethren were content. Then there passed by Midianite merchants. They drew and lifted up Joseph out of the pit, and sold Joseph to the Ishmaelites for twenty pieces of silver, and they brought Joseph into Egypt. Now Moses himself, he fled into the lands of the Midianites. Remember that? This is where we met, we meet his wife, uh, Zephora, who was a Kenite princess. Remember? Uh, if you want to, we can uh, read that. That's in Exodus chapter 2 verses 15 to 22 now when Pharaoh heard this thing he sought to slay Moses but Moses fled from the face of Pharaoh and dwelt in the land of Midian and he sat down by a well now the priest of Midian had seven daughters and they came to drew the water and filled their troughs to water their father's flocks and the shepherds came and drove them away. But Moses stood up and helped them and watered their flocks. And when they came to Reuel, their father, he said, How is it that ye are come so soon today? And they said, An Egyptian delivered us out of the hand of the shepherds and also drew water enough for us and watered the flocks. And he said unto his daughters, Where is he? Why is it that ye have left him? Call him that he may eat bread. And Moses was content to dwell in the man, with the man, and he gave Moses Zephorah his daughter. And she bare him a son, and he called him Gershom. For he said, I have been a stranger in a strange land. You see, the Midianites always provided opposition to Israel. And they moved towards, you know, hold on one second, my glasses are a mess. When they moved, we mentioned this earlier because you know when they were moving into the promised land, right? Now we see in Numbers, if you want to go look, it's going to—it's a lot of reading, but it's between the chapters of 22 and 25. You will see that the Midianites—they were actually in league with the Moabites. In Joshua, we see that they were in league also with the Amorites. We'll actually look at some of that real quick. That's in uh, Joshua chapter 13. Verse 21. And all the cities of the plain, and all the kingdoms of Sihon, of Sihon, king of the Amorites, which reigned in Hishbon, when whom Moses smote with the princes of Midian, Evi, Rechem, Zur, and Hur, and Reba, which were dukes of Sihon dwelling in the country. Okay. <clears throat> now, there are various groups of these Midianites. But they, they all merged with the Ishmaelites, okay? And they were very prosperous traders. Uh, which is, uh, if you look in Genesis 37, you'll see it in verses 25, 26, 27, and 28. So 25 to 28. And they sat down to eat bread, lifted up their eyes and looked, and behold, a company of Ishmaelites from Gilead, which we just read about, where they were bearing spicery, balm, myrrh, going to carry down to Egypt. And Judah said unto his brethren, What profitest thou? Which we already read all that. You know. Uh, and it says, Then they passed the Midianite merchantmen. They drew and lifted up Joseph out of the pit. So. And then also, uh, in Judges chapter 8, we also saw... In um, chapter twenty, uh, chapter eight, verse twenty-four of Judges, we saw there where it says, "And Gideon said unto them, I would desire a request from you, that you would give me every man an earring of his prey, for they had golden earrings because they were Ishmaelites." From this chapter, that we're in right here, chapter six, all the way up until chapter seven, we will be seeing. The, what is known as the Gideon cycle, okay? It shows us that once again, you know, Israel has fallen back into this apostasy, okay? All their leaders are unable to, to, uh, to gain a real deliverance. 
With this one, we see a judge, a judge who actually contributes to their decline. Okay, we see, we'll be getting to that when we get to chapter 8. So let's go ahead and look at that before we get started. So go, go back to Judges chapter 8. And I want you to look at verses 24 all the way to 27. We already read verse 24. So we're just going to go to, you know, read on 20. And they answered, We will willingly give them. And they spread a garment and did cast them cast therein every man the earrings of his prey. And the weight of the golden earrings that he requested was a thousand and seven hundred shekels of gold. Besides or beside that, that's in beside ornaments and collars and purple raiment that was of the kings of Midian. And beside the chains that were able uh, about their camels' necks. And Gideon made an ephod thereof and put it in his city, even in Ophrah. And all Israel went there, went thither, a whoring after it, which things became a snare unto Gideon and to his house. <clears throat> so, what we're going to do this week, you know, like I told you, we're separating this into two chapters, or <laughs> we're separating chapter six into two different sermons. We're going to read the entire book, uh, the entire chapter six, okay? And we will just, and next week, unless I change my mind, we'll just read the verses that are relevant to next week's video, okay? So let's go ahead and read Judges chapter 6, verses 1, all the way to the end, which is verse 40. I know that's a lot longer than what we usually do, but we're going to go ahead and read the entire chapter, verses 1 to 40. And the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord. And the Lord delivered them into the hand of Midian seven years. The hand of Midian prevailed against Israel. And because of the Midianites, the children of Israel made them the dens which are in the mountains and caves and strongholds. And so it was when Israel had sown that the Midianites came up and the Amalekites and the children of the east even they came up against them, and they encamped against them, and destroyed the increase of the earth, till thou, till thou come in, unto Gaza, and left no substance for Israel, neither sheep, nor ox, nor ass. For they came up with their cattle and their tents, and they came as grasshoppers for multitude, for both they and their camels were without number. And they entered into the land and destroyed it. And Israel was great, impo greatly impoverished because of the Midianites. <clears throat> and the children of Israel cried unto the Lord. And it came to pass, when the children of Israel cried unto the Lord because of the Midianites, that the Lord sent a prophet unto the children of Israel, which said unto them, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, I brought you up from Egypt, and I brought you forth out of the house of bondage. And I delivered you out of the hand of the Egyptians. And out of the hand of all that oppressed you. And drave them out from you, before you. And gave you their land. And I said unto you, I am the Lord your God. Fear not the gods of the Amorites. In whose land ye dwell. But ye have not obeyed my voice. And there came an angel of the Lord. And sat under an oak. Which was in Ophrah that pertained unto Joash the Abizurite, and his son Gideon threshed wheat by the winepress to hide it from the Midianites. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him and said unto him, The Lord is with thee, thou mighty man of valor. And Gideon said unto him, O my Lord, if the Lord be with us, why then is all this befallen us? And where be all his miracles, which our fathers told us of, saying, Did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt? But now the Lord hath forsaken us, and delivered us into the hands of the Midianites. And the Lord looked upon him, and said, Go in, this thy might. Go in this thy might. And thou shalt save Israel from the hand of the Midianites. Have not I seen, sent thee? 
And he said unto him, O my Lord, wherewith shall I save Israel? Behold, my family is poor in Manasseh, and I am the least of my father's house. And the Lord said unto him, Surely I will be with thee, and thou shalt smite the Midianites as one man. And he said unto him, If now I have found grace in thy sight, then show me the sign that thou talkest with me. Depart not hence, I pray thee, until I come unto thee, and bring forth my present, and set it before thee. And he said, I will tarry until thou come back, come again. And Gideon went in, and made ready a kid, an unleavened cake, of, of an ephah, a flour. The flesh he put in a basket. <coughs> he put the broth in a pot, and brought it out unto him under the oak, and presented it. The angel said unto him, Take the flesh and the unleavened cakes, lay them upon this rock, pour out the broth. And he did so. Then the angel of the Lord put forth the end of the staff that was in his hand, and touched the flesh and the unleavened cakes. And there rose up fire out of the rock, and consumed the flesh of the unleavened cake, and the unleavened cakes. <laughs> then the angel of the Lord departed out of his sight, and when Gideon perceived that he was an angel of the Lord, Gideon said, Alas, O Lord God, for because I have seen an angel of the Lord face to face. And the Lord said unto him, Peace be unto thee, fear not, thou shalt not die. <coughs> Excuse me. Then Gideon built an altar there unto the Lord, and called it Jehovah Shalom. And to this day it is yet in Ophrah, of the Abizrites. And it came to pass the same night that the Lord said unto him, Take thy father's young bullock, even the second bullock of seven years old, throw down the altar of Baal that thy father hath, and cut down the grove that is by it, and build an altar unto the Lord thy God upon the top of this rock. In the ordered place, take the second bullock, Offer a burnt sacrifice with the wood of the grove, which thou shalt cut down. Then Gideon took ten men of his servants, and did as the Lord had said unto, unto him. And so it was, because he feared his father's household and the men of the city, that he could not do it, do it by day, that he did it by night. And when that and when the men of the city arose early in the morning, behold, the altar of Baal was cast down, and the grove was cut down that was by it, and the second bullock was offered upon the altar that was built. And they said one to another, Who hath done this thing? And when they, when they inquired and asked, they said, Gideon, the son of jo jo Joash, hath done this thing. Then the men of the city said unto Joash, Sorry, my pages are so thin and, and sick. Bring out thy son, that he may die, because he hath cast down the altar of Baal, and because he hath cut down the grove that was by it. And Joash said unto all that stood against him, Will ye plead for Baal? Will ye save him? He that will plead for him, let him be put to death. Whilst it is yet morning, if he be a god, let him plead for himself, because one hath cast down his altar. Therefore on that day he called him Jerub Baal, saying, Let Baal plead against him, because he hath thrown down his altar. Then all the Midianites and the, Mal and the Amalekites and the children of the east were gathered together and went over and pitched in the valley of Jezreel. But the Spirit of the Lord came upon Gideon, and he blew a trumpet. And Abizar was gathered after him. And he sent messengers throughout all of Manasseh, who also were gathered after him. And he sent messengers unto Asher and unto Zebulun, 
and unto Neph Naphtali. And they came up to meet him. And Gideon said unto God, If thou wilt save Israel by mine hand, and thou hast, as thou hast said, behold, I will put a fleece of wool in the floor. And if the dew be on the fleece only, and it be dry upon all the earth beside them, shall I know that thou wilt save Israel by mine hand, and thou hast, as thou hast said. And it was so, for he rose up early on the morrow, and thrust the fleece together, and wringed the dew out of the fleece into a bowl of water. And Gideon said unto the Lord, Let not thine anger be hot against me, and I will speak. But this once, let me prove, I pray thee, but this once with the fleece, let it now be dry only upon the fleece, and upon all the ground let there be dew. And God did so that night, for it was dry upon the fleece, and there was dew on the ground. So let's go ahead and do like we do every week, right? And what do we do? That's right, we go back and we read the first verse again. And the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord. And the Lord delivered them into the hands of Midian for seven years. <clears throat> this is where we see that name, Midian, right? The Midianites. They were these wandering herdsmen from somewhere east of the Red Sea. Okay, uh, And back in the book of Numbers, we see that they had been dealt a blow, right? And they still resented Israel because of it. Uh, we see this in, uh, we'll go ahead and read it. It's in Numbers chapter 31, verse 18. Numbers chapter 31, verse 18. But all the women, children, that have not known a man by lying with him, keep alive for yourselves. This is when they killed all those Midianites, okay? Uh, so they became the worst nuisance that Israel was ever to face. Uh, the Midianites were actually the half-brothers of Israel, right? Because they descended, like I told you earlier, from Abraham and his second wife, Keturah. We saw that back in Genesis chapter 25, right? We will, uh, we will see in verse 2 here, right, that Israel had fled into the mountains during this oppression. Now once again, we see here in verse 1 that Israel has has uh, has sunk back into this this uh, this apostasy, this idolatry, uh, the infidelity, and once again, what are they doing? They're intermarrying, right? They 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 never seem to learn. They reach out for God when they're in trouble, but as soon as that trouble is over, they fall right back into worshiping these false gods. You know, you uh, I've discussed this several times where I tell you, you know, uh, you shouldn't come to God during your hard times. Well, you, you should, but a lot of people will only come to God during their hard times, and then once those hard times are over, they're back into that lifestyle that they were in before. So what we see here with Israel is God is chastising them. Because of that, you know, because they'll, they'll come back to God, and as soon as they're delivered, they go back into that idolatry. You know, so he allows here, in chapter 6, he allows Israel to fall into the hands of Midian. So let's go on ahead and look at verse 2 now. And the hand of Midian prevailed against Israel, and because of the Midianites, the children of Israel made them the dens which are in the mountains and caves and strongholds. You see, Israel has, they slipped back into their sins, like we said, and because of this, they got their troubles. We see here in verse 2 that they ran, that they ran and they hid. They hid in these dens and these caves. Kind of like someone with a guilty conscience, right? You know, sin, it, it, uh, it disheartens you. The only food that Israel had was what they took with them into the caves. Because the invaders, they took everything else. And since they, they gave what, what uh, should have been given to God to Baal, you know, God sends an enemy to take away from them. And we see that they lived in these caves. And they were hiding from these Midianites. The caves only give you a little bit of protection, though. 
they would have found places to hide where they could withstand their enemy. If you think about it, at least if you're in a cave, the enemy can only come in from one way, right? At least they were relatively safe. So let's move on to verse 3 now. And so it was when Israel had sown that the Midianites came up and the Amalekites and the children of the east, even they came up against them. So what does it say here? It says that this attack came after Israel had, 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 uh, had sown, right? They, they planted. It shows us that they had waited until after winter. It says that the Midianites came up. Where would they come up from? Well, they would come up from Canaan, right? The Midianites are from the other side of Jordan. And it's, it sounds like they must have been south of Israel. You know, they, did, they didn't come along either because it says, and the, the uh, they didn't come alone, I should say. It says because it, it says they came with the Amalekites and the children of the east. Now notice how all of these, all of them, Amalekites, Midianites, the children of the east, all these are mentioned as enemies of Israel. So they all joined up with uh, together to oppress Israel. These children of the east, these are what we call Arabians. <clears throat> That's what Josephus tells us, right? It says, even they came up against them. This is, of course, speaking about how they became a confederacy. These three people formed into one. And they all came together with one thing in mind, and that was going into the land of Israel and, and, and oppressing the Israelites. Now, let's look at verse 4. And they encamped against them, destroyed the increase of the earth, till thou came unto Gaza, and left no substance for Israel, neither sheep, nor ox, nor ass. It says they encamped against them. Well, of course, that means that they just built camps surrounding them, right? So that they, 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 could, send, they could send out people at, at their pleasure and just plunder them. You could, if you wanted to, you could change it to say they were fixing their tents against them. Because that's what the Vulgate says. The Targum says that they dwelt by them, or they fixed their inhabitation by them, right? To me, at least, this sounds like, uh, like they came at them for battle. Not only that, but they came at them like a bandit would, to pillage and plunder, to destroy their hard work. That's what it says right here. It says, and destroyed the increase of the earth. They destroyed their corn, which would be, of course, wheat. The, the grass, before it, was, they, they, before it even had time to ripen, they destroyed it. They would have done this. And who knows? Maybe they, they I don't know, maybe they fed it to their cattle. Maybe they carried some off with them. It says something interesting, though. It says, Till thou come unto Gaza. Now, Gaza is a principality that actually belonged to the Philistines. It, 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 lay, it lays in the western part of Canaan, on the shore of the, the Mediterranean, of course. These people would have, you know, moved, mowed, mowed from the, they, they moved from east as they come to, to Gaza, they would have moved through the whole land, cutting down all the fruits of the earth that belonged to Israel, and they gave it to their cattle, like, like I believe. It says that, <coughs> as they did this, it says, and left no sustenance for Israel. That means there was nothing left, no food at all. No food to feed the Israelites. They cut down the corn. They cut down the grass, the vines. There are olive trees, all of it, just to make, just to make it sound. To me, it sounds like, like there wasn't enough to eat that would even keep a, a man alive. It says neither sheep nor ox nor ass, not even enough food to feed their animals. They even carried the animals away. Read the last two verses again. It sounds like they destroyed all of Israel's crops every time they planted them. They also took their animals as well. They are attempting to starve Israel off of their land. My best guess at who these uh, children of the East are is probably the people of Haran. Okay, so 
Let's move on to verse 5 now. For they came up with their cattle, their tents, and they came as grasshoppers for multitude. For both they and their camper, camels were without number, and they entered into the land to destroy it. They were traveling by camel. So we can get from this one. If you, if you do just a little bit of research on camel travel, you will see that if they were heavily loaded down, they could travel for about three or four days and they would cover about 300 miles. And this is with no food or water. The Midianites and others who, who tended to invade Israel, they often would travel with camels when they would invade. They would gather up everything that they could and they would leave. Just devastating the people. Look how it describes them as being like grasshoppers. There's so many of them that they ate and destroyed everything. They had no intention to save anything at all. They came, they destroyed, they left. It's that simple. That's just how they were. Now let's go on to verse 6. And Israel was greatly impoverished because of the Midianites, and the children of Israel cried unto the Lord. It says that they are greatly impoverished. They were brought low. They were they were they were they were, they were famished because of the Midianites. Because the Midianites had done what? They destroyed their crops. They had nothing to eat. And what did they do? What they always did. Okay? It says the children of Israel cried unto the Lord. But think about it. Shouldn't this have been the first thing that they did? I mean, we see here that the first thing they did, they ran and hide. I'm not a one to point fingers and say they were wrong. Better late than never, right? But see, they had been serving these false idols. These false gods. But this says that they cried unto the Lord. What does this show us? This shows us that they knew, right? They had, they had enough sense to cry out to the one true God, Yahweh, their God. Even though they had, been tur they had turned their backs on Him. The sad thing to realize from all of this was that the only time that they cry out to God is when the times get tough. I mean, look at this. They did not cry out to him until they were without food. They were unable to help themselves. Then they cry out to God. They cry out for help. Just look at the next few verses as we go on. We get this this we get some unidentified prophet who who God sends and he urges them to return to God. And, and, and to end their the, the, this will end their oppression up until this point all that Israel had done was cry out for relief but God God wants something more He wants them to confess just like we see in Hosea Five, fifteen. I will go and return to my place till they acknowledge their offense and seek my face in their affliction. They will seek me early. If you noticed, all of these enemies were not their real problem. No, no, no. Israel's real problem was that they were disobedient. Now, as a deliverance minister, the one thing that I always preach, you know, if you were to call me into your home for something related to deliverance, one of the things I will always preach to you is the need for repentance. Repentance comes before deliverance. You see that in Joel. Joel chapter 2 
verses 12 to 17. Therefore also now, saith the Lord, turn ye even to me with all your heart, and with fasting, and with weeping, and with mourning. Rend your heart, not your garments, and turn unto the Lord your God. For he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, great kindness, and repenteth him of the evil. Who knoweth if he will return and repent, and leave a blessing behind him, even a meat offering and a drink offering unto the Lord your God. Blow the trumpet in Zion. Sanctify a, sanctify a fast. Call a solemn assembly. Gather the people. Sanctify the congregation. Assemble the elders. Gather the children and those that suck the breast. Let the bridegroom go forth of his chamber and the bride out of her closet. Let the priests, the ministers of the Lord, weep between the porch and the altar. <coughs> Let them say, Spare thy people, O Lord. Give not thine heritage to reproach, and the heathens should rule over them. Wherefore should they say among the people, Where is their God? Okay. Now, let's go back to Judges chapter 6, and we're going to look at verse 7. And it came to pass, when the children of Israel cried unto the Lord because of the Midianites... Do you see that? Are they crying out to God because they've sinned? You know, that thing that had brought all of this upon them? No. They're crying out because they're being oppressed by the Midianites. But you see, at this time that we're reading about, they didn't recognize it. I don't believe they did anyway. I think that this is why God, in His goodness, His infinite goodness, His compassion, he wants to deliver them. So he sends a messenger to give them the knowledge of their sin so that he can prepare them for deliverance. That's what we see in the next verse. So let's look at it. Verse 8. And the Lord sent a prophet unto the children of Israel, which said unto them, Thou sayest, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, I brought you up from Egypt and brought you forth out of the house of bondage. Look where it says right there. It says, The Lord sent a prophet. We see throughout the Old Testament that God would, would use prophets in, in cases like this. You know, these these remote these remote cases before Samuel. Okay. Later we saw the band of prophets that were founded by Samuel in 1 Samuel. Chapter, 5, chapter 10, verse 5. After that thou shalt come to the hill of God, where is the garrison of the Philistines, and it shall come to pass, when thou art come thither to the city, that thou shalt meet a company of prophets, coming down from the high place, with a psaltery and a tabret, and a pipe and a harp before them, and they shall prophesy. We also have these prophets, people like Elijah and Elisha, right? And then, then the and then we also have the writing prophets, the major and the minor. Here, though, we see this prophet, this unnamed prophet, and he was sent to bring a divine curse, right? Because Israel had not remained faithful to the Lord. The Lord is using this prophet to tell them about their 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 error. And, and he does this before he helps them, doesn't he? This prophet is, in a way, he's kind of like Deborah. But she was what they called a prophetess. This prophet brings news to these rebellious people. News from God. Notice, though, that he starts off by reminding them that it was God who brought them out of Egypt. So let's look at verse 9. Verse 9 now. I delivered you out of the hands of the Egyptians, out of the hand of all that oppressed you, drave them out before you, and gave you their land. Notice how he says, out of the hands of the Egyptians. This is further than just Egypt. Because remember, 
these Egyptians had chased them. They had trapped them at the Red Sea. The Israelites were in great distress, and what happened? God took the Egyptians out at the Red Sea. He parted that sea, allowed Israel to pass, and then he destroyed the Egyptians. He tells them, out of the hands of all, all that oppressed you. This is the Amalekites, right? Remember how all the kings of the Amorites made war on the Israelites? They had oppressed Israel's passage through their land. Also, we have the king of the Canaanites too. All of these kings had banded together against them. God not only delivered Israel from them, but he says, drove them out before you and gave you their land. Think about that. He gave them the land of Sihona and Og. Not only that, but he gave them all of Canaan. He says he drove the inhabitants out. God fought their enemies. God brought them here to this land that he promised them. He kept his promise. He kept that covenant. But never once has he broken a promise. Never once. So let's go on. Let's, let's go ahead and look at verse 10 now. And I said unto you, I am the Lord your God. Fear not the gods of the Amorites, in whose land ye dwell, but ye have not obeyed my voice. <clears throat> Here he is. He's talking about the covenant that God made with the father, with their fathers, reminding them that they should not have even acknowledged these false gods. He's the one true God. He said for them to fear not the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. They should not have been afraid of these false gods. They can't hurt them. Also think about it. If you're afraid of them, in a way, with you showing fear, you're showing reverence. It's a way of worshiping them. Worship is not for false gods. Worship is for the one true God. Worship is for our Lord, not false idols. <coughs> Allow me to say something here. The Amorites, I think that they're only mentioned because they were the principal people that were among the Canaanites. So I think, I think they are just a placeholder here for all of Canaan. Okay, but anyway, did the Israelites hold true to the covenant? Well, well, look what the prophet says here. He says, but ye have not obeyed my voice. This means that they hadn't embraced God. They didn't show him the fear. And they certainly didn't worship him. They'd fallen, once again, into idolatry. And, and, and this is a sin, okay? The idolatry is a sin. It is the one, it's the one that keeps, it's the one sin that this prophet is reproving them for. He's pointing it out to them that they had not kept the commandments. They had not stuck to the law. God made them a promise. He promised Israel that if he, that, that if he would always, that, that he, he promised Israel that he would always be with them. But Israel, look where they are here in this story. How did they get here? Because they were disobedient. We are about to be introduced to our next judge soon. And that's a man named Gideon. When we are introduced to Gideon, we're told that he is threshing wheat in a wine press. A wine press is a pit in the ground. And he's doing it so that the Midianites can't find him. We see one of the appearance, one of the appearances of Jesus here, mentioned here in the in in in, in, the, in the Old Testament as an angel of the Lord. Think about this, Gideon. Gideon, he hears the words of the Lord. He hears it directly from his mouth. It says, "The Lord is with thee." How does he address Gideon? He calls him a mighty man of valor. What does that tell us? 
the Lord sees this man who is hiding. Not as he is. He doesn't see Gideon as he is at that moment. He sees Gideon as he will be. Thinking about what I just said, I want you to look at something with me. Look at Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 32. What shall I more say? For the time would fail me to tell of Gideon, and of Barak, and of Samson, and of Jephthah, of David also, and Samuel, and the prophets. Hmm. Huh. So, let's now look at verse 11. And there came an angel of the Lord, and sat under an oak, which was in Ophrah, that pertaineth, that pertained unto Ju Joash the Abelazarite, and the, his son Gideon threshed wheat by the winepress to hide it from the Midianites. There he is, an angel of the Lord. The word angel literally means messenger. This angel is identified as the Lord himself in verses 14, 16, 23, 25, and 27. We also see the same angel identified as the Lord several times. Flip to Genesis. We're going to look at chapter 16. We're going to read verses 7 all the way to 14. An angel of the Lord found her by a fountain of water in the wilderness, by the fountain in the way of Shur. And he said, Hagar, Sarai is made, whence comest thou? Whither wilt thou go? She said, I flee from the face of my, my mistress Sarai. And the, Lord, the angel of the Lord said unto her, Return to thy mistress, submit thyself under her hands. And the angel of the Lord said unto her, I will multiply thy seed exceedingly. It shall not be numbered for multitude. And the angel of the Lord said unto her, Behold, thou art with child, and shalt bear a son, and shalt name him Ishmael, because the Lord hath heard thy affliction. And he will be a wild man. His hand will be against every man, and every man's hand against him. And he shall dwell in the presence of all of his brethren. And she called the name of the Lord that spake unto her. Thou God seest me. For she said, Have I also here looked after him that seeth me? Wherefore the well was called Ber Lahay Ber Roy. Behold, it is between Kadesh and Bered. Hmm. Okay, now let's look at same in Genesis. Go to chapter 18. We're going to look at verse 1. And the Lord appeared unto him in the plains of Mamre, and he sat in the tent door in the heat of the day. Also, let's look at chapter 32. Verses 24 to 30. And Jacob was left alone, and there wrestled a man with him until the breaking of the, dawn, of the day. And when he saw that he prevailed not against him, he touched the hollow of his thigh, and the hollow of Jacob's thigh was out of joint, and he wrestled with him. And he said, unto, he said Let me go, for the day breaketh. And he said, I will not let thee go, except thou bless me. And he said unto him, Why is, What is thy name? And he said, Jacob. And he said, Thy name shall be called no more Jacob, but Israel. For as a prince hast thou power with God and with men, and hast prevailed. And Jacob asked him and said, Tell me, I pray thee, thy name. And he said, Wherefore is it that thou dost ask after my name? And he blessed him there. And Jacob called the name of the place Peniel, for I have seen God 
face to face, and my life is preserved. Now, we see our judge, Gideon, right? And it says that he's threshing wheat in the wine press so that he could hide it. This shows us, right, that the people are in serious distress. But it also shows us how short their supply of grain was. Why do I say that? Well, the job that he's performing was typically done by cattle. Gideon's doing it. Not only is Gideon doing it, but he's doing it in a wine press instead of on a threshing floor. Wine press is bare ground. Threshing floors are made out of wood. They are terrified that these Midian they're terrified of these Midianites. Gideon was supposed to become this great military and spiritual leader. You know, he delivers Israel out of bondage from these Midianites. We see how he's visited by this angel of the Lord who encourages him with strong words. We we see how he destroys the altar that his father uses to worship Baal. And he also builds an altar to the Lord. He, of course, later follows the commands of God and he reduces his own army from 32,000 men to 300 and goes out to face the Midianites whose army is more than 135,000. That's, that's greatly outnumbered. That's like 450 men of Midian against one man of Israel. Only with the help of God could he defeat these odds? And because of this great victory, we know Israel tried to make Gideon king. No, of course Gideon does refuse. He he retires to his home in Israel and he's blessed with forty and Israel is blessed with forty years of peace. Because of this, Gideon is mentioned for his faithful deeds, like we read earlier in Hebrews. <coughs> now I know many of you like to sit there and think you know why would God use me you know when we feel that calling on us we all think that you know why would God use me I know this because I am one of you when, when I got the calling to, to do ministry I was terrified it took me years to answer but it is people like Gideon here in the Old Testament that show us God calls the ones that we expect the least. Look at all the judges that we're going to be reading about. They're all untrained. None of them are trained to do the job that God called them to do. Because it's and the reason the reason for this is it shows that it's not their strength. It's not their ability. It's God's ability. That is something that we can never question. Now, back to the story. The land of the Israel is caught up in this idolatry. They're, they're being oppressed on every side. Even in all of this, God knows who he needs. And he sends the angel of the Lord to go call on Gideon. Gideon, a man who is raising wheat and hiding it from the Midianites. One of the most unlikely people. A very simple man. That is who God calls now, let's move on to verse 12. The angel of the Lord appeared unto him and said unto him, The Lord is with thee, thou mighty man of valor. <coughs> As we saw in the last verse, the angel of the Lord sat under this oak tree. Gideon was busy, you know, he's down there threshing, threshing the wheat. He didn't see the angel. So the angel stands up, walks over to where Gideon's at, making sure he can see him. The verse says, And said unto him, the Lord is with thee. This shows us that you know Gideon was, was busy threshing away. The presence of the Lord was with him. Most likely Gideon was crying out to heaven, you know, about what Israel was going through. And while doing you know, he was so we've all been there, right? Where we're at work or we're whatever we're doing and, and we're we're praying as we're working. He was probably in that deep meditation, thinking about his people, thinking about what it would take to deliver them. 
Now, you could also take it a different way, okay? We've discussed this about how the angel of the Lord might be Jesus himself. This could be him saying that he is God and is there with him. The Targum, the Targum has it say, my word is thy help. So look what the angel says, thou mighty man of valor. This makes me think that maybe Gideon was very stout. We know that he was courageous. I bet you that when that angel appeared, he had an increase of strength. This, would probably, this was probably said to him as a way of encouraging him, do what you're supposed to be doing. In the Bible, as well as today, when people see angels, they're only seen by those who are meant to see them. So the angel here was sent by God to speak to Gideon, and only Gideon would have seen him. Could you imagine how knowing that the Lord was indeed with him would have encouraged Gideon? Right? Because Gideon is just a simple man, a farmer. He, he never thought of himself in any other way. Definitely not a mighty man of valor. But now, now he sees it. Because God sees it. He sees what he wants Gideon to be. Right? Now look, what Gideon, look how Gideon responds in the next verse. Verse 13. Gideon said to him, O my Lord, if the Lord be with us, why then is all this befallen us? Where be all his miracles, which our fathers told us of, saying, told us of, saying, Did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt? But now the Lord hath forsaken us, and delivered us into the hands of the Midianites. He starts off with, O oh my Lord. Now, this is not what we would usually think of as surprise. No, no. It's similar to saying, Sir? We see it used the same way in John. Chapter 4, verse 11. The woman saith unto him, Sir, thou hast nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. From whence, thou, whence then hast thou that living water? Also, 1 Peter, Chapter 3, verse 6. Even as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, whose daughters you are, as long as ye do well and are not afraid with any amazement. We then see Gideon reply with something that I'm sure many of us have said, or in some cases have asked of them when someone is going through a rough time. If the Lord be with us. You see, Gideon believes, as many who, who have seen such times, that the Lord has forsaken us, right? It shows us weakness in his theology. You see, the Israelites are going through this purely because God wants his people to know that he is there. He wants to care for them. Imagine the bravery that it took to speak to an angel of the Lord like this. Now, is it possible that Gideon did not know this was an angel? I mean, we've, we've seen several times in Scripture where angels appear as men. And due to all of, all of this tribulation at the hands of the Midianites, Gideon was in low spirits. He's like the majority of us. He doesn't understand why we can go through troubles if God truly is with us. I believe that he doesn't know about the conditions of the covenant. But we see here shortly how God promises Gideon that he would be victorious. He makes it clear that it will not be because of Gideon. No, it's going to be because surely I will be with thee. Similar to what we see in Exodus chapter 3. Verse 12. And he said, Certainly I will be with thee, and this shall be a token unto thee that I have sent thee. When thou hast brought forth the people of e out of Egypt, you shall serve God upon this mountain. 
then also in Joshua chapter 1 verse 9. Have not I commanded thee, be strong and of good courage. Be not, be not afraid, neither be thou dismayed, for the Lord thy God is with thee, whithersoever thou goest. This reminds us, we should not rest in our own abilities. We should not count on our own abilities. The things that we have, we shouldn't count on things like our abilities and our resources. We should rest in the, our confidence on God on His presence, on His power. Look what Paul says in 2 Corinthians. <coughs> Chapter 1, verses 8 and 9. For we would not, brethren, have, ye, have you ignorant of our trouble, which came to us in Asia, that we were pressed out of measure, above strength, and so much that we, desi we despaired even of life. But we had the sentence of death in ourselves, that we should not trust in ourselves, but in God which raiseth the dead. He also says something else. So look at chapter 13, verses 9 and 10. For we are glad when we are weak, and ye are strong. This also we wish, even your perfection. Therefore I write these things of being absent, lest being present I should use sharpness, according to the power which the Lord hath given me to, ed to edification, and not to destruction. Also, look at Hebrews chapter 13 verse 5. Let your conversation be without covetousness, and be content with such things as you have. For he hath said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. Amen. So now let's look on let's go on to verse 14. And the Lord looked upon him and said, Go in this thy might, and thou shalt save Israel from the hand of the Midianites. Have not I sent thee? You see that? Earlier this being was called the angel of the Lord. Here in verse 14, he's being called Yahweh. That is why Lord is spelled in all capital letters. I told you about that, remember? So, we see the Lord is looking on Gideon with all earnestness. Was smiling at him. Showing him kindness. So that Gideon knew that he meant well. The verse says, said unto him, Go in thy might. Thy might. Body and mind. Am I right? The Lord gave him this already. It was increasing. I'm sure that Gideon would have been aware of it. The verse says, And thou shalt save Israel from the hand of the Midianites. And he does. This is why we're discussing him here today. Also why Gideon is counted among the saviors of, and the judges of Israel. The verse says, Have not I sent thee? He sent him to do a job, right? To save Israel. That way Gideon knew that he was given a command for by God. He now had enough authority to go and do it. Notice, like we saw when we reviewed Job, the Lord does not answer Gideon's question, does he? Instead, he tells him, go and fight for Israel, and gives him a promise that he's with him and will strengthen him. God promises him victory. Now, let's move on to verse 15. He said unto him, O my Lord, wherewith shall I save Israel? Behold, my family is poor in Manasseh. I am the least of my father's house. There's no way of being certain if he suspected who he was speaking to. Of course, it's possible that he started to think that this was someone who was sent by God and was speaking to him and, and was taking issue and maybe he was taking issue with what he was asking him to do. Look what it says. Wherewith shall I save Israel? He's asking, how is it possible for me to do it? Sound familiar? <coughs> he points out that he didn't even, he didn't have an army or even enough money to do it. He says, Behold, my family's poor in Manasseh. 
And Manasseh is his tribe. He was he was the least of, of the thousands of that tribe. He says, and I am the least in my father's house. So he's also the youngest. The youngest son. I've seen where some like to believe that his father would be the uh, the Chiliarch, the leader of like ten thousand of, of like a thousand men, but if you read this again, you see that this is just not possible. Now I'm not saying that it's not possible for his father to have some wealth or some substance. No, maybe he had a little bit of power, a little bit of authority. I mean, he did have servants because we see we're, we're going to see in verse twenty seven that he takes his he takes like ten of them with him. You know, the ver this verse here, though, it shows us that, 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 that Gideon's humble. He's not thinking high of himself. He certainly was not dependent on his own strength. Think about it. Ne next time you feel like the Lord's calling you to do something, and, and you start thinking, I'm not the right person, I'm not qualified. Look what Gideon's saying. He, he felt the same way. He felt that he wasn't qualified. God qualifies you. Amen. Now let's look on to verse 16. And the Lord said unto him, Surely I will be with thee, and thou shalt smite the Midianites as one man. You see what the Lord tells him? Surely I will be with thee. If you look at the Targum, it translates it as, My word shall be thy help. This should be good enough to any objection unworthiness and weakness my help is with you the Lord goes on and thou shalt smite the Midianites as one man as one man that means all of them as if they were just one person it will be entire destruction not one man will be left you see the Lord doesn't accept our excuses he doesn't you can make all the excuses you want. The Lord doesn't accept that. Look right here. He's reassuring Gideon that he's going to help him. Telling him that it will be so easy for Gideon to defeat them. That it will be like he fought one person. Pay attention as we move forward. Gideon needed to know God in a more personal way. If he was going to represent him to the public, he needed to know more. He needed to know more. How many false ministers have you seen fall think about that how many they go to college right they learn about ministry they get that college certificate for some prestigious university they go out and preach only to fall why because they skipped the most important step they did not have a relationship with God that's why you see them being money hungry, sleeping with prostitutes, committing some great sin. <clears throat> I saw a while back how there's there's a preacher on YouTube who was saying that he was an atheist. He's an atheist, and he preaches to one of the largest congregations. If you plan on being a member of God's army, you must first worship him before going into warfare. We see Gideon's desire for God's acceptance when he requests the first sign, as well as his offering at the time when the first of Israel is starving. The fire that consumed the offering encourages Gideon. He was not headed into battle alone. So let's look at what verse 17 says now. And he said unto him, if now I have found grace in thy sight, show me a sign that thou talkest with me. Gideon is acting like Moses here. He wants a sign. He, he wants proof that this is the Lord that's talking to him. Now, interestingly, in both cases, we see that the revelation was so rare and that wickedness was so prevalent that, of course, they wanted to be assured. You know what? God's full of grace. He's so full of grace. He's, he, so of course he gives it to him. 
as we go forward, we see that God makes it known using fire from heaven. Just like how in every case, once the sinner realizes that he's in the presence of God, he becomes conscious of his guilt. Gideon, he's filled with awe and fear of death. Once he sees that this is the Lord, he knows that the Lord also sees him and his immorality, his sins. So he fears that he should die. But of course, God is full of grace. So he promises him life. We see this several times in the Bible. Look at Ezekiel chapter 1. We're going to look at verse 26 to 28. <clears throat> and above the firmament that was over their heads was the likeness of a throne, as the appearance of sapphire stone. And upon the likeness of the throne was the likeness as the appearance of a man above upon, above upon it. And I saw as the color of amber, as the appearance of fire round about within it, from the appearance of his loins even upward. And from the appearance of his loins, even downward, I saw, as it were, the appearance of fire. And it held brightness round about, as the appearance of the bow that in the clouds in the day of the rain. So was the appearance of the brightness round about. This was the appearance and the likeness of the glory of the Lord. And when I saw it, I fell upon my face, and I heard a voice of one that spoke. Also, Look at Isaiah. Chapter 6, verses 1 to 9. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up. His train filled the temple. Above it stood the seraphims. Each one had six wings. With twain he covered his face, and with twain he covered his feet, and with twain he did fly. <clears throat> and one carried him to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the posts of the door moved, and the voice of him that cried, and the house was filled with smoke. Then I said, Woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then flew one of the seraphims up unto me, having a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with the tongs from off the altar. And he laid it upon my mouth, and said, Lo, this hath touched thy lips, and thine iniquity is taken away, and thy sin purged. Also I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? Who will go for us? Then said I, Here am I, send me. And he said, Go and tell the people, Hear ye indeed, but understand not, and see, you, see ye indeed, but perceive not. Also, this one should still be a little bit fresh in your memory. We haven't long been finished with Revelations. But look at Revelations chapter 1, verse 17. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. He laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not, I am the first and the last. So full of grace, so wonderful. Now, let's look at verse 18. Depart not hence, I pray thee, until I come unto thee, and bring forth my present, and set it before thee. And he said, I will tarry until thou come again. This tells us that Gideon was going to go to his house, okay, his and his father's, you know, or it could be his or his father's. We don't know. We're not told. But he goes there to get some food so that he could uh, entertain the Lord. And the Lord assures him that he will not leave until he gets back. So Gideon says, and bring forth my present and set it before thee. Now, present in Hebrew, mean, it, it doesn't say present. It says, my meat offering. He did this as a way of uh, proving 
if his visitor was more than a man. So, of course, many believe that this was probably a sacrifice. But as we read on, I think we see proof that this was not just some sacrifice. And besides, sacrifices are made by a priest, and Gideon is not a priest. He's a farmer. And besides, this was not the place to make a sacrifice either. What, what do you mean? Where, where's the altar? All of this is not to mention that Gideon was not even sure that this was the Lord yet. So why would he make a sacrifice to this man? The Lord responds to him and says, I will tarry until, thy, until thou come again. Think about this. He's asking the Lord to wait on him. And the Lord does it. And he waited some time as well because now think about this. Gideon also had to prepare it all. Look at the next verse. Verse 19. Gideon went in, made ready a kid, unleavened cakes of an ephah of flour. The flesh he put into a basket, put into the broth in a pot, brought it out unto him until the oak and presented it. It says the flesh he put into a basket. So he 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 put and and he also put the broth in a pot. This meat, or as it says here, flesh, was probably roasted. They, they did this by cutting it into little pieces. Then they would put it on a skewer and, and put it over the fire. <coughs> but broth, that was, that was for them to use immediately. Okay, The meat is put into a basket. That shows us that it's for the Lord to take with him. It's, for a, it's a supply for the road. And he brought all of this to the Lord as an offering. Okay? Was verse 20, and look at what verse 20 tells us that the angel of the Lord does. The angel of the Lord said unto him, Take the flesh and the unleavened cakes, and lay them upon this rock, pour out the broth. And he did so. He doesn't eat it. That's right, he, he doesn't eat it. He tells Gideon to do this. He says, Take the flesh and the unleavened cakes. Lay them upon this rock. Put them on the rocks, right? Not 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 like we not like you would as a table for you to eat. But he's telling him to use the rocks like an altar. This was a rock that was there. No, no doubt that the oak probably grew up, you know, either out of it or on it. Maybe the rocks under the oak. Either way, Gideon put the offerings on top of a rock. We see that later on in verse 26, an altar is built here. He says, and pour out the broth. He would have poured the broth over the meat and on the cakes, okay? And since they were on the rock, the broth would have been poured out over over it all. This must have been cold. So, this must have been cold by now because he had carried the broth from home. And now it was even cooler as it was poured out over the rocks. So we see that Gideon did what he was told to do. Because the verse says, and he did so. Could you imagine how Gideon must have felt? This shows faith. He's being ordered to basically waste the food that he brought. He brought this food for the angel to, 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 to eat, to be entertained with. And he's being told to do this. He must have thought that this angel was intending to give him a sign. Right, so he, he went on ahead and did it. The rock is the altar. He lays out the flesh and the bread. He pours the broth on top. That's like the, the broth is like a here like a like a drink offering. So we're we're here to verse twenty one and verse twenty one seems like a good place to stop, so we're gonna go ahead and, and it'll be the last verse today. So let's go ahead and read it. It says Then the angel of the Lord put forth the end of his staff that was in his hand, and he touched the flesh and the unleavened cakes, and there rose up fire out of the rock, and consumed the flesh of the unleavened and the unleavened cakes. Then the angel of the Lord departed out of his sight. So Gideon did what he was told to do. He he laid the you know the flesh and the, the bread out on the rock, and he poured the, the 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 drink over the top of it, right? And the Lord sends sends a fire to, to consume it. 
the food and the angel they both vanish now does it say they that this angel walked away no they depart from his sight so when the fire happens the angel departs with the fire leaving Gideon in awe right when someone meets God especially a fallen man we automatically fear his wrath Back in the ancient days, they believed if you met God, you would die. The fact that his sacrifice was accepted showed that Gideon was accepted as well. It restored him. It restored his comfort, his peace. Have you ever noticed how fire is a sign of divine presence? It's, it's throughout the Bible. I've, I have a lot of verses here that we can look at. Look at Exodus Chapter 3, verses 2 to 4. <clears throat> and the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. And he looked, and behold, the bush burned with fire, and the bush was not consumed. And Moses said, I will now turn aside and see this great sight, why the bush is not burnt. And when the Lord saw that he turned aside, God called unto him out of the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And he said, Here I am. Okay, well, let's look at more. Chapter 13, verses 21 and 22. And the Lord went before them by day in a pillar of cloud to lead them the way, and by night a pillar of fire to give them light to go by day and night. He took not away the pillar of the cloud by day, nor the pillar of fire by night for, from before the people. Also, look at verse chapter 19. Let's keep moving. Verse 18. Chapter, uh, And Mount Sinai was altogether on a smoke, because the Lord descended upon it in fire, and the smoke thereof ascended as the smoke of a furnace, and the whole mount quaked greatly. All right, let's go on. Let's look at Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 4, verse 4. When the Lord shall have washed away the filth of the daughters of Zion, and shall he have purged the blood of Jerusalem from the midst thereof by the spirit of judgment and by the spirit of burning. Then we have Ezekiel. We got chapter 1, verse 27. And I saw as the color of amber, as the appearance of fire round about within it, from the appearance of his loins even upward, and from the appearance of his loins even downward. I saw it I saw as it were the appearance of fire, and it brought its brightness round about. Then we have Daniel chapter seven, verse nine. Got a lot of them. <laughs> I beheld till the thrones were cast down, and the ancient of days did sit, whose garment was white as snow, and the hair of his head like a pure wool. His throne was like the fiery flame, and his wheels a burning fire. Then you also have uh, Zechariah, chapter 2, verse 5. For I for I saith the Lord will be unto her a wall of fire round about, and will be the glory in the midst of her. Then you have Acts. You have Acts chapter 2 verse 3. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as, a fire, like as of fire, and it sat upon each of them. And you have Hebrews. Let's keep going. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 18. For ye are not come unto the mount that might be touched, and that burned with fire, nor into blackness and darkness and tempest. Then, you, of course, you have Revelations again. Let's go on and look at some Revelations. Revelation one fourteen. 
His head and his hairs were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were as a flame of fire. The fire here and it, with Gideon, it consumes the offering. Like I said, this shows us that it was accepted. It shows us that God accepted the, the offering and he accepted Gideon. It shows Gideon that it was God. The angel disappeared instantly as well. That is what we see here in this final verse of the week. Now next week we'll come back. We'll, we'll finish up chapter 6. We'll be starting off, you know, right, right where we left off. Right there with verse 22. And, you know, we'll be moving along and finish up chapter uh, chapter 6. I hope to pray that something here today touched you in some way. Maybe uh guided you maybe made you feel better about your, your own position with the Lord you know if draw you to repentance if you're uh, if you're someone who's been in need of that and if you if you have and you, you need to you you want help with that you can reach out to me I will be glad to help you um, guide you to 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 uh, a closer relationship with God all you have to do is message me and I'll be glad to answer your messages um, so thank you all for joining me here. Like I said, I pray that the Lord has touched you with this message this week. Which get you know the story of Gideon. Gideon's a great story. Um, Gideon's a, you know so I pray that you know you learn something from that. So thank you for joining me here today, and I hope to see you all here next week for an all new sermons of the part. May God bless you and keep you, and I'll see you all then.